have our second social.coop happy hour. And uh, we have a couple of social.coop users, members who are also went to the platform co-ops uh, conference that recently happened entitled Who Owns the World? And uh, we're going to hear from them about their experiences there. So, um, Matt, would you like to start? Yeah. Um, so, I think I've been to all of the platform co-op conferences that have been held in New York. Um, so it's kind of interesting just to sort of see the continuity and, and differences between between this one and ones that have happened in the past. I think there's one year where they did it in Hong Kong rather than in, in New York, um, which was actually sort of, there were some interesting moments uh, at the conference with the professor from uh, the from the university there, who is, I guess, a sort of primary contact of Trevor's, talking about what's been going on with the protests and uprisings um, in Hong Kong recently and its connection to setting up kind of movement platforms. So that was, that was kind of a fascinating connection. Um, but it's gone kind of, you know, there, there's a few years, or there's one year where it was like kind of, I think, purposefully kept small, a few hundred people. The first time I went, it was like huge. It was free and like 1,200 people showed up and all the rooms were packed and people were sitting in the aisles. And so this year kind of felt like more again in that, that mass scale. Um, and it was interesting to see sort of like, you know, what progress sort of had been made since, since this community started gathering. You know, there's certainly some, some co-ops that were very much in their infancy in the, in the first year or two. Uh, they're making real strides to me. Um, I think savvy um, was one that really stood out to me in terms of, you know, the, the progress they've made and, and there was one side conversation that maybe we can get into later that I felt like I heard um, some really some really interesting insight into you know as they've been successful sort of how they've you know the the nature of conversations they've had with with more traditional VC and sort of the points of conflict that meant that that or that uh, or the points of tension that that um, that the VC is kind of like shut left the VC shying away from them, um, which I think was very useful for, for broader thinking. So I guess those are maybe a few quick first impressions if um, maybe Mika wants to go next. Yeah. Um, so this was the first platform co-op conference I've been to. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I don't have the sort of historical context. So it was interesting to kind of jump in and be like, oh, this is what the movement looks like right now. Um, I think one of the things that came up when I was um, before I went to the conference that I saw sort of like the repercussions of or the movement around during the conference was the sort of like worker co-op um, culture and and scene <laughs> and uh, the platform co-op culture and scene and movement and, and how those are interacting with each other. Um, and I think it's changing. I think there's more involvement and more sort of crossover between the two now than there used to be. Um, the first panel that I ended up going to was about worker participation and um, there ended up being a bit of conversation about like multi-stakeholder um, cooperatives or, and there was a presentation by up and go, which is the, um, platform cooperative developed by the Center for Family Life in Sunset Park in New York. Um, and that's a platform that's, you know, it, it uh, helps connect consumers with cleaning services by um, cooperative members. For those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's, it was interesting to see sort of like an intentional increase um, focus on the places where the worker co-op movement and the platform co-op movement um, are, are finding their groove together and, and kind of like growing together. Um, and I've heard that like that's maybe hasn't been the case in the past and that it's like, it seems to be more intentional um, now. So that was cool to see. And I enjoyed that, but I still think there's a lot of room to grow there and a lot of ways that like the platform co-op movement can learn from the worker co-op movement. Um, I think something else that came up for me was this, like, the, you, Matt mentioned this um, a little bit, but the idea of capital is uh, it always comes up in college spaces and the challenges around that and the challenges to raising capital. Um, I think they're slightly different for platform co-ops specifically than for worker co-ops uh, because of, like, the amount of 
sort of like collateral or like what, what does the co-op actually own and, and how does that um, work if you're getting just a loan? Um, there's so many complications with, with VCs and, and anyone who wants to take like an equity approach to raising capital for a platform co-op. So I think I, I saw a lot of co-op platform cooperators that were like, oh, we, we could have identified the issue, but we don't have access to capital and we don't totally have an answer for that yet. So um, I saw a lot of excitement around like what are models for raising capital that could work, but I think it's like that's really a point where people are still um, still figuring things out. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, I can talk about it a little more later, um, but something that I marked as relating to our work at Social Co-op was the idea of consentful tech. Um, I saw a presenter uh, who talked about consent in technology and, and how we've sort of like, you know, the, the standard experience on the internet now is not one of consent. Um, and I was curious to like think about that deeper with people in social co-op about like how what the platform that we're building, um, whether or not like we're considering consent in tech and, and how we can be doing that more. Yeah, uh, I can pass it. Leo, do you want to talk about your experience there? Yeah, I mean, it, it was great. I felt a bit creepy because I saw so many people and I knew so much about them and what what they've been doing, but they probably had no idea who I was. So, you know, I was introducing myself to somebody and I already knew actually what he's going to say, what his name is and what the, what the project he or she is involved in. But uh, yeah, it was it was uh, almost surreal to see all these people who I've interacted on and, and, and got exposed to on, on social media and then meeting them um, meeting them in real life and um, I think it, it will be quite uh, interesting to see what will happen because there are certain cooperatives like Social Coop or Resonate that by nature are, are fully global and then there are these certain platform cooperatives that are, are obviously very very local like, uh, like Up and Go which is only in, in New York. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what will happen in the future, whether, um, whether there will be a sort of um, these two different types of platform cooperatives moving to different paths and finding different needs and, and so on. And um, yeah, um, can't say anything, can't think of anything uh, insightful to say at the moment, but I'll, I'll gather my thoughts a bit. Maybe I can throw one more one more thing that, that Leo's comment sparked for me um, was that the very last session I went to was um, kind of a review of some of the materials for the um, for the platform cooperativism toolkit that's that's been you know they got some grant money to to work on um, and so it's sort of developing and one thing I found you know and I think that this is a problem that we've visited off and on with social.coop but also i think it's it's felt like was kind of a pretty broad one is that there's there wasn't sort of a clear like um slam dunk kind of entity and incorporation thing um framework for creating a co-op that has a truly transnational membership right you know you have all these different national laws and forms of ownership and sort of the two the two models that they were looking at for the um for the you know, for, for the toolkit that they were kind of reviewing and it was very much a review and getting feedback. And so it's, I think it's continuing to be iterated and developed um, were kind of the, the Colorado limited cooperative association is a fairly flex flexible structure. And then, you know, kind of jerry rigging uh, uh, Delaware LLC, because there's a lot of kind of international international ownership is fair, fairly, well trodden for that particular model but it was very interesting to me to sort of kind of hear and be thinking okay those were the two that that they were really sort of like looking at and modeling um and i know there's been conversations in the past uh, and i've talked to people in various places being like oh is malta would that be a good place to incorporate as you know estonian east citizenship so it seems it feels like that that was from the very beginning that was kind of a question that's been raised and it was interesting to me that it's still still feels like something a nut that hasn't been fully cracked yet. So, Matt, on that last uh, point that you were mentioning about the incorporation framework for this kind of international platform co-ops, it seems like Resonate must have figured this out on some level, um, right, as they've got 
I'm pretty sure members from lots of different countries. Huh? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, and there's, you know, there, there's kind of an interesting thing with them, um, you know, because they recently changed leadership. And that was one of the other things I learned at the, I, I learned at the conference. I met the, met the new CEO who's been, who's, who ran a record label, you know, kind of an indie record label back in the nineties and seemed very, very enthusiastic to be taking this, this project on. So that was nice to see. Um, but, you know, they had also kind of experimented, you know, it was like uh, Sam and Victor um, who were kind of early, early involved with social dot co-op um, had been sort of trying to create something that was perhaps even like an early version of what Leo has been working on, you know, a thing that would allow for, you know, very small scale, almost, almost cryptocurrency esque scale, um, investments in, in co-op. So the sort of first round of little bit of investment money that went into resonate came through that. So I wonder to a certain extent, you know, how, yeah, I'd be curious to learn more about how they're, they're managing, managing that and you know, how within, within or without, you know, legal and corporation structures they've, they, they've been operating. Yeah, I know that uh, Resonate is, I believe, registered in the UK, uh, in Ireland, but they would have actually, I, I talked with Sam Toland, who is also a member of Social Corp and who, who was involved with the legal side of Resonate. And he told that it would have actually made more sense if they would have registered in the UK. I don't know the specific legal details, why that is the case. And there is this form of European cooperative, but there's a small detail that it costs 30,000 euros to register as one. So it's not uh, not very friendly. And I've, as far as I know, there's maybe like a dozen of cooperatives that have, that have used the form. So it's, it's uh, some weird legal structure that nobody ever uses. And I bet that when it was uh, constructed, they didn't really consult people who would actually want to set up these cooperatives. So I don't know any any platform cooperative person who would have got any involvement with, with actually making the legislation. So it's um, well, one of those things. But uh, yeah, in, in that it's interesting because you basically need only one country like Estonia or Malta to create the proper legal structures and then everybody can do it. So it's, it's, it's an interesting sort of political or, or legal reform movement to make because you only need one country to make it happen to make it easy to register and, and, and create a, a, a global platform cooperative and then everybody can use that country to do so. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it would have been one thing that I, I hope that uh, in the future the platform cooperative movement will focus. Uh, perhaps have some researcher from the, from the Digital Cooperative Institute look what country would be most suitable at the moment to, to do so. And are, do you know if there are any limits to like, you know, say I'm operating entirely in Italy, but I, Malta, Malta ends up being the place or, you know, Estonia ends up being the place that has the best co-op law. Like, does it matter? Do you have to have anything there? Or <laughs> like, how can you choose which country to? Yeah, you would need a country where you could register without actually having nothing physical there. And I know that the Estonian business sort of laws are, are shaped in that they want to create it so that you could register a company in like 45 minutes to Estonia fully online. Uh, that's their plan. And if they could do the same for cooperatives, that would, that would obviously be great. And I think that I discussed with somebody there or somewhere else about it. And uh, they currently, they don't, they, they have not, not had enough demand to do the same for cooperatives, but uh, if there would be uh, enough these sort of cooperatives that would would need that sort of a thing, uh, I think that they would be uh, would be more than happy to do so in the future, Estonia. So we need to find some platform co people in Estonia, and they should start lobbying for this. Um. I guess we can just kind of open it up to questions. I've got a couple, but if other people would like to chime in, you can unmute yourself and ask away. Mike, are you saying something? Yeah, I guess um, I'm just thinking about the, the toolkit idea. Uh, 
And I guess I wonder how there can be a toolkit because my expectation would be there were so many different ways of platform cooperating that you know, I wouldn't necessarily expect that there would be a toolkit. Um, you know, for example, you know, if, a, if a cooperative is producing something material, that's, that's not the same as a cooperative that's producing something uh, which is personal service or a cooperative which is producing something um, documentary or media wise. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know, you know, maybe from people who've seen the toolkit, just how uh, universal our expectations might be about toolkits. So I can speak, I haven't looked in, in detail and into sort of all the documentation, but I can sort of speak to what I saw during the, during the presentation. And a lot of it felt almost like, you know, trying to like parse out some decision trees and in kind of like a series of flow charts for people to say, okay, like, what are you trying to accomplish if, you know, and, or what characteristics does it want to have? And then, you know, you could do it this way, this way, or this way. So it, so it felt to me like they're in sort of the stage of just sort of like mapping out a large number of possibilities and then you know having it be so that I could imagine it be becoming something where you almost like have a little quiz where you go through and you just answer what you're trying to do and then you know it spits out kind of what here's the best or here's a few um, sort of possible options to narrow it down perhaps in almost as a because it you know that that very the very nature of that um, diversity of possibilities can can be quite overwhelming when you sort of sit with it and figure out, okay, where do I even start? So that was the sort of, that, that was at least the piece that I saw that I found, I found interesting on that front. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that distinguishes the platform co-op movement with the wider cooperative movement seems to be like a very strong focus on, on worker cooperatives that are typically the, the sort of smallest segment of the overall cooperative movement. But uh, I remember that the Platform Cooperative Consortium, I think, joined the Worker Cooperative Federation of United States. I can't remember. But anyway, the Central Organization of Worker Cooperatives. And that's one of the things. I, I think, you know, worker cooperatives are the most badass form of cooperative. You know, I have nothing but love towards worker cooperatives. But I, I also wonder, like, is there something specifically in platforms that make that form of cooperative more suitable than, than elsewhere? Like, uh, you know, I, I also think that, uh, that credit unions are cool and, and all that sort of stuff. So, I, so that, that, that's one of the things is that uh, I wonder is that why is it that, that platform cooperatives seem to be very focused on worker ownership, whereas the rest of the cooperative movement seems to be very focused on consumer ownership? And one, one, uh, one possible one possible element, and of course, this is probably one of those overdetermined things with lots of variables. But um, it's certainly kind of given Trevor Schultz's influence on on sort of pushing this forward. You know, he comes out of a digital labor um, and kind of like you know an interest in in labor generally. So I think the that the the the, 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 the closest connection between the cooperative movement and the, the labor movement is, is in the worker cooperative space. Um, so I think that's what, that's one piece. And then I, probably the other is, is that, you know, some of the most kind of egregious violators, so to speak, um, seem to have been, uh, you know, these labor platforms like Uber or, you know, the Deliveroo and, the, and these others where you have this kind of mass, you know, ma this like mass process of making labor much more precarious um, and so when you're like, okay, does do those platforms make more sense as a consumer co-op or worker co-op? You know, the, it seems like at least at the moment, the sort of worker abuses are far more salient to people than the sorts of, you know, consumer predation, at least so long as it's in, in the capture market through, um, underpricing st strategy mechanism, you know, consumers aren't hurting yet. Once it's a monopoly that might change, but. Yeah, I, I think like a lot of the focus, and, and this is not a, a bad thing, a lot of the focus has been on like how, how to make these platform works better for the workers in them. And that's great. But I, but I also wonder like, should we try to seek also advantages for the consumers in that how can platform cooperatives be 
better for the customers of those platforms, not just for the workers. Now, that's both of them are, are hard to make. And I would argue that perhaps it's, it's harder to imagine an Uber that would be better for customers than it is to imagine an Uber that would be better for drivers. I mean, that's quite an easy thing to imagine. But, but how could you make it also better for the customers? And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a harder challenge, but I, I don't think that we should, we should sort of, um, well, yeah, it's, it's something we're, we're thinking about also. Like, what are the, what are the advantages for the customers of, of using platform cooperatives? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that's true. I have a few things. I'm trying to organize my thoughts to respond to that. Um, I think that one way that it can be, if you've got a platform club that's sort of like built to uh, change the worker experience, you are also often building in like participation and feedback loops in a way that you wouldn't be in other cooperatives. So once again with Up and Go, I, I just know that example the best. They, they did all this testing before they came out with the platform with the workers themselves saying, does it work for like the consumer to pick out these things? Like what questions do you want to be asked? And then they, because they're already sort of thinking like in, you know, in on that level of participation, um, there was also like consumer testing that happened. And it's like, and I, you know, balancing those two needs and having continual feedback loops, I think, um, ends up being like a smoother experience for the consumer because you're not working with people who like are, you know, are in a bad labor situation, especially when you're like getting connected to an actual human. Like the result of that ends up being someone coming into your home, cleaning it and, and leaving. And that's like, it's, that is like such a human connection through a tech platform that if you're, um, if there's feedback loops going on both the worker side and the consumer side, I think it ultimately ends up being smoother for everyone. Um, so that's one thing. I also think that, uh, the work, a really exciting, like direction that a lot of groups are going in is this like multi-stakeholder aspect. So in the same way, it's like, how can, we, I, I think in general, like consumer co-ops could almost always be multi-stakeholder co-ops. Like I think that about food co-ops all the time, um, where it's like, it feels like you're just kind of like missing part of the picture by not including the workers in the ownership um, and in the governance. And so I, I think there's like so many ways that, um, that like consumers are being taken advantage of with like the tech world right now um and we should be like standing up you know like with social co-op or not being part of someone so called it surveillance advertising at the conference like um so there's a lot of ways it can help consumers but then again i always feel that it's just like missing a level of analysis and a level of solidarity if you're just making a consumer cooperative without um like real uh ownership by the workers and the people who are like building it so I'm, I'm very pro multi stakeholder cops and, and think that should be a strategy utilized as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And now when I think about it, it's not actually perhaps the worker ownership that really distinguishes platform cooperatives, but it's really the multi-stakeholder cooperatives that seem to be very rare in the wider cooperative movement, but seem to be like more common than perhaps any other ownership model in the platform cooperative movement. So that's also an interesting aspect is that why is it that multi-stakeholder model seems to be so popular among platform cooperatives and so rare among wider cooperative movements. So that's a, that's a mystery that I have no idea what, what's the reason for that. Yeah, I guess I'm, I, I just happen to be reading this, this book at the moment. Which, uh, which is a, it's a, it, it's a, this this place just happens to be up the, up the valley from where I was born and brought up in Yorkshire, uh, and it's, it was like the the only producer co-op in British co-op history at the turn of the at the turn of the twentieth century, and it, it I, I've only got part way through it, but it, it's interesting how it started out as a cooperative of of people who produced cloth and dyed cloth. Uh, and within a couple of years of starting up, the board of the co-op was debating whether the workers should get a dividend or not. Um, because of the amount of capital they'd had to raise. Uh, and it was, a, you know, it was basically about the distribution of the dividend. Uh, and so it was clear that the people who, who put in capital should get a dividend. And there was a debate about the workers should get a dividend at all. Which I, I'm just stunned by that. I can't imagine how that kind of argument could take place, but it was absolutely central in the, the co-op movement at that time. 
Yeah, so I'd say one other thing on the the multi stakeholder thing, and perhaps I'm you know I'm I'm looking at some specifics here, but it's it seems like there's there's at least a few influences that have been kind of key. You know, I think you know especially in the in the early years of the platform co op stuff, I haven't heard co- quite as much prominence about or sort of dialogue around it more recently. But the the fair shares association and the fair shares model of multi stakeholder cooperation seem to be kind of you know have a little moment in the sun that I think might have influenced some folks thinking. Um, a second piece is in the U S um, you know, several of the, the co-ops that have kind of gone through um, you know, that have been connected both to start co-op and Jason Weiner, who's the um, co-op attorney out in Colorado. Like, um, and he was the one for instance, who set up savvy, which is, which has like multiple stakeholder groups. Um, so I think kind of with the sort of Colorado limited cooperative association structure and sort of his, the creativity that he's been applying to some of this stuff. Um, I think that, that that's had some influence on th- the trajectory of um, folks thinking and the, of like, you know, when you look at successful models, what do, what do they look like? Right. Um, you know, Savvy's one. Um, uh, you know, I think there, there's, there's also the one was a, a Stocksy, which was interesting to see kind of, and hear some, you know, that was another thing just sort of hearing as in, in the first platform co-op conference they were really like the one that could be held up as like a platform co-op that had a business model and revenue and was like you know making it happen and so there's definitely some interesting conversation around tensions between not even you know formal stakeholder groups but also the sorts of um, things where it'd be like people who do it for a living versus hobbyists um, and kind of like the the level of barriers to entry that there should be to sort of get into the co-op and kind of what, um, you know, what subjects kind of were sort of like appropriate and, you know, in line with the co-op's culture. Should it be kind of more like high culture stuff or should it be things that are, that are really kind of, you know, geared to the, the mark, the sort of market demand and what happens when that market demand is out of alignment with, um, with the values of your, your co-op where if you value diversity, I think the, one of the examples they gave, but at the same time, like, most of the people who are buying the stock photos are targeting, you know, upper middle class white people. Um, You know, how do you, how do you balance or sort of navigate that conversation sort of within a, an organization that's having to, it's inherently having to interact with that market. Um, So I did feel like there's a lot, yeah, certainly more than almost any other co-op space, a lot of discussion of, you know, managing or explicitly those, those different stakeholder groups. Yeah, I could jump in for a second. Um, uh, just the, the kind of conversation really got me, you know, thinking like, you know, kind of something, something I've thought about before, which is, are platform co-ops really their own type of co-op? Because um, it seems to me like, I mean, and I, I could be off base, and I'm sure there's some stuff I'm missing, but that really what we have are co-ops that are producer co-ops or worker co-ops and they're employing this particular type of tool that we now have available through the internet but that at the base level something like stocksy is a producer co-op just like the agricultural co-ops here in montana where i'm from where all the farmers you know you all have a product you all make you put it all together to sell it get a better price they're doing the same thing of course with photography but and then something like the staffing co-op to me it's like well that's obviously right that's just a worker co-op for temp workers that's um so to me i think it it, i i think there might be something that kind of confuses issues a little bit um to talk about platform co-ops as like their own kind of thing in the same vein as we talk about a consumer co-op or a producer co-op or a worker co-op um because they do seem so very very different you know the difference between a um, yeah, you know, a, a stock seat and a staffing co-op and a resume are going to, I'm sure, just have, a, they're going to have a lot more in common with other producer co-ops or other worker co-ops than they will necessarily with other platform co-ops. But, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and one of the things that um, I think is true is that a lot of the biggest platform cooperatives don't actually know that they are platform cooperatives. So, what I mean by this is that 
for example, the eighth largest credit union in the U.S. is fully digital. It's fully online credit union called Alliant, and it has won like in Nerd Wallet. It's, it has been chosen as the best financial institution in the U.S. But they were not present in the conference, and they probably don't know, have never heard of platform cooperatives. But you know, if somebody would go on social corp and would say that I want to set up a credit union that's fully digital, we wouldn't tell them that no, that's not a platform cooperative. That would be a, a platform cooperative. So it's it's uh, it was one of those interesting things is that uh, this this alliance, the the credit union that is fully digital, it was not present at the at the conference at all. So it. it, it it's it's a good question in that would is that is is it really just like self identification which which defines platform cooperatives or how do we define platform cooperatives and and does that also tell about disconnect between the platform cooperative movement and the wider cooperative movement in that the biggest platform cooperative in the world probably doesn't know it's a platform cooperative Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that that's the immediate question I had, uh, Leo, was why were they not there? Did nobody at the Platform Co-op Conference reach out to them? Um, because, yeah, you would think that that would be somebody you would obviously want there. Um, but, yeah, again, I think maybe this kind of siloing with our language or different types of co-op might not be doing us some, might not be doing us favors. I mean, I just think that the reason might be that Trevor has better things to do than the Google digital credit unions and try to find out if there are, you know, what, what, what's the biggest digital credit union or such. So I'm, I'm not putting any blame on him for not inviting him, but yeah. Well, it seems to me like there's also people in the movement though, right? I mean, let's not put it all in one dude. It seems to me like there's also an issue about you know, it's the uh, uh, platform co-op as the thing that you're producing versus platform co-op as the thing that the platform is a tool that you use or the platform is the product. So if you're, and so in the development of platform cooperativism, it seems a lot of the people involved and key players have been people developing platforms. So it's the developers in that sense, it makes sense for worker co-ops to be kind of a strong model. It's like, we're the people developing these co-ops. We want to do this work, co co you know, cooperatively and have those values in them. Um, on that front, one thing that I run into as a practical problem is that uh, it seems to me, if when I meet different people who are doing things like buyers clubs or CSAs or other forms of activity, that uh, at least in two cases in my hometown, I know of people who got developed software, really good software for their program. And then in one case, the person left town, the developer actually moved to another country and nobody can get in touch with her and the software just went with her. Like nobody, it's all in her, it's her personal property. So it was never a cooperative thing in that level. In another case, the, the, uh, the group that was gonna pay for the software that was developed, the group lost a grant, didn't get its funding. So they were never able to buy the software that had been developed. And again, the software then is inaccessible to us now hoping to kind of create something. So I'm concerned in, uh, about the, and this is where I feel like a platform co-op toolkit, it'd be useful if you had something analogous to, to like uh, the way that Drupal or WordPress function where there's a tool that you can easily kind of take and adapt but that's already been kind of developed with a purpose in mind. So if there were, for example, you know, a buyer cooperative buyers club template, basic kind of software that people could collaborate on, et cetera, that was open source, that was free, that was available to people. And there may be, and I just don't know about it yet, but I feel like that kind of area is someplace is something where uh, that's what I would look for in a toolkit at this point. So I wasn't at the conference in New York, but when I went to hear Trevor talk in Tokyo, that, that's what he was um, talking about for the toolkit, was that they were developing a consumer co-op platform, a worker co-op platform, uh, like something, whatever, platform, the things that they identified as the most common new 
um, platform co-ops kind of like, and my impression is that it's kind of a movement for people to, instead of um, doing a startup, like a digital startup um, that is the typical venture capital, um, that the platform co-op movement is supposed to try to get people to instead start a platform co-op or to convert their like regular, I don't know what to call it, like digital um, business into a, a cooperative business um, is the push that I'm feeling whenever I'm in that platform co-op space, which is why like a totally di wholly digitized credit union, I feel like is probably not the top of mind that people come to because it seems like not something that like it does like the traditional co-op um, structures aren't or the uh, I'm losing my words um, aren't usually the ones that are that that come to mind when you think of startup projects. I think is my impression anyway. Yeah, it's it's an interesting example of a of a traditional cooperative turning into a platform cooperative instead of sort of startup and and that reminds me I, I talked with a fellow named Joseph from Tribe there and he had this idea that instead of starting up new platform cooperatives we should buy existing businesses and convert them into platform cooperatives which seemed like uh, you know it's a, it's a it's an ambitious thought but when you think about it, it it sort of makes sense maybe that's the that turns out to be the strategy that actually is better than than starting up and that might make it uh, distinct the platform cooperatives distinct from the rest of the sort of startup world hey what maybe I'll throw one other um uh, one other thought on the kind of platform co-op term question, right? Is that in many ways it feels like sort of the folks who are kind of gathered and with the, the energy that's that's kind of brought this th this together has very much in some ways been a reaction to the sort of idea that these kind of these platform businesses is a is a new business model. And so in some ways, it, maybe it's almost like kind of less of a you know, it's kind of tangential to the, you know, okay, you have consumer co-ops, you have producer co-ops, you have worker co-ops, and then you have the industries that those various things function in, right? So, you know, the credit unions function in financial services and the, you know, food costs fun function in the grocery industry. And sort of if we almost think of these kinds of like date, and you can sort of, to a certain extent, even, you know, at this, um, at, you know, at the platform co-op conference and sort of parse out if, if that's the general category, there, you know, you basically labor brokering co-ops or labor brokering businesses, property brokering businesses for like the Airbnbs or the fair BNB reaction, um, you know, data cooperatives. Um, and th there's some interesting conversations there about folks who are, who are creating things around managing data. And then we got into actually in the session that I presented in um, a little, when I presented a little bit about social that co-op, it was a lot about sort of data sovereignty and there's an interesting discussion between the perspective of kind of owning your data as a commodity that you're being kind of cut into. So there's someone who actually had a Louis Kelso inspired uh, platform that was specifically about kind of, it's called data vest where you can basically like choose to invest your data in various things and like consent to share it with folks in exchange for certain kickbacks versus the idea of, you know, decommodifying data and having it be something that's, you know, controlled either by community or by individuals. So I th so it seemed like that there's these like, if you almost think of it, platform cooperativism less as a, a specific model in terms of structure and more, more in, as a model in terms of, you know, like thinking of it as like an industry in which there's different things where different ownership structures make sense for different subsets of that industry. I had a question um, for those of you who were at the conference. Uh, I read, I was reading the report from the conference that was in Cooperative News uh, a little while ago, and there was a quote in there from Trevor, and he said, uh, almost every single co-op we talked to said there was a difficulty making decisions. He told delegates in his opening address, adding that members don't feel like members, which sounds pretty familiar um, from other co-op stuff. So I was wondering how much um, emphasis at the conference was placed on that kind of 
of what I would think of as more bread and butter co-op issues that don't necessarily have a whole lot to do with the tech, um, or if it was more focused around the technological side. Yeah, so uh, I definitely noticed, well, I've noticed that in my own personal experience working in a co-op that was sort of designed as like a consumer co-op or bulk purchasing and, and trying to get people to actually feel like they're in a co-op. So I, I think it's just like, you know, it's a problem that uh, is, is an old problem as long as co-ops have existed, um, but it's sort of amplified with like the digital world and, and how like disconnected we are to like anything we engage with on the internet. Um, and so I did see like, I, I felt like I saw quite a bit of emphasis on that. I took like a few pictures of like slides that people had put up of their, um, their voting structures and, and governance structures. And I found, I was like surprised by how complicated a lot of them were. Um, not to say that they weren't like, like really, you know, they were like smart and I was like, oh, like it's all these different stakeholders involved. Like that's going to create this really rich ecosystem. But like, I'm like looking at this one, I'm like, there's partners, there's community, there's employee, there's the software developers, which like, you know, there's all these different numbers of people that go into a board and you know, it's just, it's like, um, yeah, definitely the, some of the most complex governance structures I've seen for cooperatives. Um, and you know, I think part of that's, size thing but it is the multi-stakeholder aspect of it like who's involved in a platform and who are you doing this for um and yeah and and so i think that's something that we're all sort of like learning the models that work the best and like beta testing things yeah re regarding that point about not feeling ownership i think there was also a sign there because i remember there was this uh, big gathering where different countries, people, representatives of different countries presented what's happening in their countries and the, the delegation from Austria and Netherlands both said that, oh, in our countries we have big cooperatives, but they're not real cooperatives. And, and the, the presentations and the work that they are doing is great, but that sort of uh, uh, scratched my ear a bit because I thought that there is a sort of thinking, per, perhaps there is a danger in sort of thinking that when there is a cooperative where you don't really feel ownership, you say that's not a real cooperative. And that's, that's a bit dangerous because if we say that when there's a failed cooperative model and we say that's not a real cooperative, we should perhaps take an attitude that there are also cooperatives that don't function perfectly, but they are still cooperatives. If, if I, I didn't put my thoughts in a perfect articulation, but Hopefully that made some sense. Yeah, no, I guess that's kind of my point is that, you know, it's, it sounds like, you know, listening to credit union people talking about trying to get members to the AGM or, um, you know, the food co-op, you know, folks trying to get, you know, people to come to the board meetings or run for the board or whatever. It's, yeah, it, it just a, a very common issue. And I know there's uh, just was wondering, you know, uh, how much, commonalities there were in, 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 uh, in addressing uh, those very common issues in co-op. Um, yeah, I, want, I wonder if that also happens that when there emerges big successful platform cooperatives that we will react saying that no, they are not any more real cooperatives because we don't feel the same sort of ownership. And I would imagine that in sort of very global platform cooperatives that would be even more realistic risk because people don't have personal interaction with each other at all. I mean, so, so one thing I'm, I'm trying to remember if there was anything particularly um, in terms of programming, but I definitely had some, some interesting side conversations with people and it was certainly a scene where there are a lot of really, really interesting side conversation opportunities, um, you know, about what, you know, when you're dealing, and to a certain extent, it's kind of the big versus small co-op tension that already exists in more traditional co-ops. But like, you know, what does member engagement look like when you have members distributed over the entire globe who rarely see each other or would never see each other in person? Um, you know, so, so like, does, does that require some fundamental rethinking of like, kind of like what we define as as like valid and valuable participation, um, you know, and I think there's some really interesting opportunities for creativity there, but it's also something that, you know, that in, even in just like theory of democracy, stepping back from like, 
you know, co-ops themselves, but like, what is the role of participation in democracy? Like how much can you expect people to sort of like engage in governance labor, um, in a meaningful way? Um, and how, how can you have effective delegation and stuff? And so I think these like broader pick questions are like very, very relevant to sort of, you know, where things go from here. Yeah, I see your notes, Matt, and I think that's a good idea to get to the last, to talk about um, lessons for social club. But I want to add one thing to that really quickly, which is, I think about this too all the time in terms of like, you know, you're always like, what's the big, the big picture vision that you're trying to get to? And it's like, say we, you know, end up in a world where like, we have ownership over like all the most important parts of our lives and like the way we consume and, and work. Um, and it's like, you just like, we can't be and I cannot be engaged in the governance of everything that I need services from. <laughs> like, that's and no one has that time. So yeah, I, I think it's really um, a question of like balancing, like where, where does the voice, like whose voice like will really make a difference if it is there. And it's like, and, and when does it matter? And when is like, when are voices being shut out? And that's like creating a problem. Um, you know, as long as there's the opportunity for participation rather than like full participation of everyone. Yeah, um, so Matt is suggesting that we take the last two minutes to do uh, lessons learned from the conference for those of you who attended. Um, so who would like to start us off? Josh, my, my question is specifically like lessons for social dot co-op. Since we are a platform co-op, what is it? Is there anything we should learn from this, uh, from what you all saw? Yeah, I guess this may seem a bit provocative, but I'm not sure that social co-op is a co-op. Um, I think we're, we're a federation of people who wish to promote this discussion about cooperation, about platform cooperation. Um, we don't trade. Uh, and I think, you know, you know, in the original model, a, a cooperative is an organization involved in trade, and it's about the ownership of the means of production and the distribution of the surplus. Um, we don't have much by way of means of production. We don't generate any surplus. So, you know, it's not clear to me that co-op is the right name for it, as distinct from being a common, for example. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't follow lots of organizational models, maybe. It doesn't mean that we can't follow the same values. But I, you know, I, I guess I need a bit of convincing that social co-op um, is actually co-op. I mean, I can throw a few, a few thoughts and, and reflections out that perhaps maybe relate a little bit to Mike's um, thing. So, so one of the, you know, there, there are a few, a few pieces. One, one was really talk, um, the, you know, that what I mentioned in the beginning, the sort of conversation around the platform co-op toolkit and what does it look like to, you know, incorporate and where does it actually make sense to incorporate? And for, you know, since, since we started that we've been kind of operating under this, you know, open collective fiscal sponsorship framework, which, you know, has worked well enough for what it is, for what it is. But if we sort of do want to sort of expand into something where we're providing more services to members aside from, you know, a mass and on instance and a, um, and a, you know, a Lumio, Lumio instance and a few other, other sort of, you know, minor services. Um, you know, that's, that's something that we're going to want to revisit. And at that point, you know, where the business model moves from, all right, well, you know, we have a few folks getting token payments and, you know, a few hundred dollars a month coming in, uh, from kind of volu voluntary sliding scale contributions. Like if we're sort of moving from that into something that is a more kind of robust thing that would have staffing, all of that, you know, the, I think to me sort of what I think this, as it develops the, the platform co-op toolkit will be something that could be, you know, could be sort of a source of some answers for how to, how to approach that. If that's something that we as a community decide we want to move towards versus the sort of kind of, you know, maintaining more of that, that kind of membership democratic, you know, communities, communications, community commons that, that kind of, you know, maybe that is what we are sort of more, more at the moment. Um, but so for me, I think a lot of the kind of thinking was if we do want to take the, the, the leap to formalizing sort of what resources and what approaches and what challenges would, would, will we need to sort of wrestle with as, as, as we, as we do that. So, I mean, that's kind of a quick thought.
Mika, you want to go next? Yeah. Um, yeah, your, your question definitely is making me think, Mike. And, and I think often when I go to, like, when I think about platform co-ops and the movement, it's kind of, I, I end up questioning social co-op or trying to determine exactly what the, the goal is. And I think we've talked about this a little bit in, like, working groups and, and on the Lumio um, but it's like, are we there to be an alternative to Facebook, you know, it's like that, or are we there to be, um, a, a group, a, you know, a space on the internet for, for people to sort of, you know, commons, um, to, to share ideas about these topics and, and yeah, and I think we haven't really landed on that. Um, but I'm wanting to get sort of like closer, I think, to a big vision. Um, and I think that hearing these conversations or like, you know, going to events like this is making me want that because, uh, a lot of the co-ops are there to be an alternative to this like tech industry that we don't want to be any part of. So, you know, it'd be nice to know sort of like if that's our vision or if it's, um, you know, something else, which would also be great. Yeah. I, I sort of see Mike, your point, and and it's it's totally reasonable to say that it's not it's not a cooperative because it's not trading. But on the other hand, it is providing a service, so you could sort of see it as a cooperative or or, or not social co-op. But regarding the sort of lesson from the conference, I think social co-op could perhaps play a role in in uh, diminishing the sort of disconnect between the wider cooperative movement and the platform cooperative movement because I think that it would be important for there to be this sort of 24-7 living stream that any person working in cooperatives or involved in cooperatives could immediately jump in and that could be social co-op. So eventually, if you talk about big vision. I would love to see that anybody, you know, you somebody in Philippines starting an electric cooperative could join in social co-op and, and start sharing their thoughts and there would be people from the alliance, the, the big digital credit union and all that connecting together there. And regarding the, the thought about sort of global platform cooperatives, I think it would be great if social co-op could start acting as a sort of community that, that would that would be a place where you could find early adopters for these global platform cooperatives, so like Resonate or others. And I have a conflict of interest here because I'm involved with part of the couple of those global platform cooperatives that I would wish Social Corp would have uh, people adopt into. But uh, yeah, I think it would it would be valuable if anybody who has this who starts up a global platform cooperative could approach social co-op and we would be very friendly and encouraging and, and sort of try it out and would understand if everything wouldn't perfectly work but would still be supportive and I think that could be an important role for social mm -hmm. co-op to play. Uh, can I throw one one last thing real quick in in response to Leo because so just something that there are a number of projects that were sort of localized or starting in a few places but had the potential sort of clearly things like Airbnb, which is kind of, you know, this community sort of oriented alternative to the Airbnb stuff and others um, where I think that there is, I did feel this really strong need for, okay, so if we have these things that are replicable, how do we sort of quickly get all the people in various places who could help kind of get them going locally in whether you're thinking of it as a franchise or even just kind of like get a hundred people who are interested in having their houses cleaned by a worker co-op and then have, you know, brightly kind of expand to that market because they already have something there, but just sort of creating, you know, I think that that's def that like that role is something that I could see uh, what Leo was saying, us having the possibility of playing and helping sort of seed and, and sort of magnify the power of things that people are creating on the basis of more, their more local connections. So Great. Um, so, Brandon, you got want to chime in here? Share your thoughts? Yeah, I can say a quick hello. Uh, I'm Brandon Dubé. I'm, I'm based in the Washington, D.C. area. I was, I was at the conference, and I, I met Mika. I was very interested in joining. Uh, you know, the what conversation is is uh, emerging with Social Dark Co-op? I, I think for me, um, 
something that like I'm finding the gaps in is, is connecting the local co-op movement here to the platform co-op movement. So I really resonated uh, with that. Um, I think like people um, may not be aware of uh, all the possibilities. And I think like it takes seeing what other people are doing to realize that there are other ways to do things. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm really happy that, you know, this is happening and, and that, you all are, are creating that space and it's, it seems very generative. So thank you. 